All right, Holly, take it away. All right, so thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation for myself to speak, but also I'm happy to see arithmetic dynamics featured <laughs> on, uh, on Vantage. Um, so to open up the series, uh, the idea here is that we're going to discuss some open problems, the, the four or five of us in arithmetic dynamics, discuss some open problems and questions in arithmetic dynamics that might be of interest. And even though my title doesn't say it yet, <laughs> um, what I'm going to discuss is, is a dynamical version of the money Mumford conjecture. And I'm going to use it essentially as an illustration of, of a broader phenomenon, which has sort of opened a, a new line of research in arithmetic dynamics, which is um, applications of Eric Kaloff theory and equidistribution theory to questions of unlikely intersections. So I will explain to you what all of that means. I will explain to you what the picture you are looking at is. <laughs> And we'll talk about this dynamical money Mumford conjecture. Okay, so first of all, what do I mean by an unlikely intersection? So before you bother reading this slide, let me just sort of expose it for a second. So in algebraic geometry, when we talk about, say, in some ambient variety, the question of two sub-varieties intersecting, this simply comes down to a question of dimension, right, or co-dimension. And so, for example, if I'm looking in, say, a two-dimensional space and I have a curve and, say, I have a point, <laughs> then the dimension count tells me that they're not very likely to intersect, right? It will only happen in sort of a, a Zariski non-dense way, namely when the point lies on the curve, okay? Now, this phenomenon is, again, sort of replicated if we don't just take one point or, say, finitely many points, but, in fact, a countable set of points that nonetheless, even though it's infinite, we still don't expect, say for example, a curve in a two-dimensional space to hit this countably infinite subset of points um, unless there's a good reason to, okay? So now that the sort of generalities are out of the way, let me give you sort of the illustration or basic illustration of a prototype theorem here, which is a theorem of Ihara, Sarah, and Tate answering a question of Langs. okay? So this is from uh, the 60s. And the statement is the following. So suppose that we have a non-zero polynomial, which I'm calling here f of x, y. And we're going to assume that that polynomial, so in two variables over the complex numbers, we'll assume that that polynomial has infinitely many solutions with both coordinates roots of unity. Okay, so solution say zeta, eta, so that both coordinates are roots of unity here. And what they proved is that in this case, so when we have this curve, which intersects this infinite countable set of roots of unity, or rather roots of unity in both coordinates, right, in A2, then that polynomial actually must have a factor of the form, say x to the a minus c y to the b, where a and b are integers and c is a root of unity, okay? It's not hard to show the, the converse, right, that if you actually do have a factor of this form, then you necessarily have infinitely many points, which are both roots of unity in both coordinates, rather. So what is behind this theorem? Well, the first sort of like silly thing to say is that is, this is not somehow like a real geometric phenomenon. There are plenty of polynomials like this that have the property that they contain pairs of points which lie on the unit circle, right? So it's not about just sort of the real geometry or something of the roots of unity, okay? So what's actually going on, and here's an example which I really just included because <laughs> I wanted you to have this picture. Say, for example, if this polynomial comes from the graph of a, of a map from the Riemann sphere to itself, which fixes the circle, okay? All right, and so what this is really coming from is the fact that roots of unity have an algebraic description, right? And that algebraic description is that they're the torsion points of the multiplicative group C star, okay? And those make these points special in an algebraic sense, while on the other hand, the curves that we find can contain infinitely many of those special points in both coordinates are exactly those which are torsion translates of algebraic subgroups of C star cross itself, okay? And so what this theorem of Ihara, Sarah, and Tate is really telling us is something about the interaction between the algebra and the geometry of, of I suppose, C star squared. Okay, so algebra and geometry and their interaction is essentially at the heart of that particular unlikely intersection question. Even though I haven't mentioned it, notice that there's also already some arithmetic going on because roots of unity are, of course, algebraic, right? 
And so we might think about these lying in some extension of Q or something like that. And we'll return to that perspective later. But the key point here is that this is an illustration of a much more general guiding principle known as the principle of unlikely intersections. And what this principle says is that a variety is unlikely to contain as a risky dense subset of special points unless there's a good reason for it, okay? And in the example of Ihara, Sarah, and Tate, what special means here, special points in particular, means torsion points for the group structure of, of A2 or rather of C star 2, okay? All right, so this is what I mean by the principle of unlikely intersections. There's no dynamics yet. <laughs> so let's just talk about sort of the classical picture here. So we are gonna focus on what I'll repeatedly probably call the classical, that's really just to contrast it with the dynamical, as opposed to say aging, the theorem. Um, we'll focus on, for the moment, the classical Manning Mumford conjecture. And I've written sort of the friendliest version of this below. And this conjecture was proved by Renault in 83. And it states the following. So it's a direct analog essentially of Ihara Serentate but it deals with the case of a curve living inside of its Jacobian, okay? So what do we do? We take a smooth projective curve, which cannot possibly be a torsion translate of a subvariety of its Jacobian, i.e. it has genus at least two, okay? And just to make things sort of handleable, I, I assumed for the moment that it's defined over some number field, okay? Then if I embed that curve into its Jacobian based at some algebraic point, say P, on the curve, then what Crenot proved and what Manny Mumford um, predicted is that the intersection of the embedded curve in its Jacobian with the collection of torsion points for that Jacobian is in fact a finite, i.e. not the risky dense subset of the curve. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Classical first step. Okay, I see some chat going on, but I don't think any of it are questions for me, so. All right, so in greater generality and sort of more obviously in the context of the unlikely intersections as I presented it a couple of slides ago, what was actually proved is that a subvariety of any abelian variety contains as a risky dense subset of torsion points if and only if that subvariety is special for the algebra of the abelian variety. Namely, it's a torsion translate of an abelian subvariety. Okay. And so this is what I'll refer to also as the classical Manning and Mumford conjecture. It's also a theorem. And this is part of an entire sort of umbrella of, or it's under the umbrella of all these unlikely intersection theorems. I'm not going to talk about them more today, except for Manning and Mumford, um, but because they'll come up in the, in the dynamical series, just a couple of things for you to look up. Um, I noticed, by the way, that in the slides, because of my funny format, none of the links are available. So let me in the chat put the link to Sonia's book. Hopefully that worked. Okay, so uh, see the book of Umberto's if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the sort of classical perspective. But what I'll point out is that really what's changing is this notion of what a special point or a special subvariety is. And then the same question being asked about what's the interaction of the Zariski geometry with this notion of special. Okay. All right. So I'd like to dynamically reinterpret this first in a very shallow way. <laughs> okay. So let me make a couple of definitions in order to do so. So if I have a set S, any old set, which admits a self map, say F, then I'm going to, because I wanna do well by my other arithmetic dynamics speakers, <laughs> um, omit the little circle that you usually see for composition <laughs> and just write Fn for the nth composition of F. Okay, so I have a self map and I'm repeatedly applying it to say n times. Okay, if I do so, then I can define say the forward orbit of a point in S or even a subset more generally to be the sequence of iterates under this self map F, okay? And if that finite, or sorry, if that forward orbit is finite, then we say that the subset is pre-periodic, okay? If we actually have the set equal to itself under some iterate, then we say it's periodic. And you can see up here, I'll zoom a little bit in case it's not clear, 
just an illustration of what this means for points, right? Periodic means that we live in some cycle under iteration of f. Pre-periodic means we eventually map to some cycle under iteration of f. OK, so here's the thing. If my set is a group and I look at the map which comes from addition, OK, so for any, say, positive integer m, I consider the multiplication by m map, which simply adds an element to itself m times. Then the torsion elements of the group are precisely the pre-periodic points for this map. OK, so we have this dynamical reinterpretation of the algebraic statement of being a torsion element of the group, OK, which is that you're pre-periodic for some natural map associated. OK. So, Holly, there's one question in the chat about uh, what happens if TNS are not finite. I'm definitely making no assumptions whatsoever on TNS. They could be infinite, certainly. Yeah. Um, I suppose if they're finite, then everything has finite forward orbit. And certainly there are interesting questions to ask about finite dynamics like that. But in my world, usually the, the base sets will be, say, C points or rational points of varieties, so infinite. OK. All right, thanks, Rachel. OK, so we have this translation then, OK, which gives us a, a reinterpretation of this algebraic notion of special, i.e. torsion, into a dynamical notion of special, i.e. preperiodic for some map. OK, and this is just sort of the beginning <laughs> of, of a dictionary or thesaurus, whichever you prefer, um, connecting sort of the study of the arithmetic of elliptic curves and the study of complex dynamics. OK, and we're going to get into this dictionary a little bit. So we've already talked about how torsion points and preperiodic points are related. Right. I'm going to discuss in detail this second equivalence, the notion of canonical height on an elliptic curve and how it relates to a notion of dynamical height. I will not talk about these last two in any significant way, but I mention them only because I want you to be able to come back to these slides if you want to, because uh, this third equivalence equating sort of z and q subgroups of points to forward and grand orbits of maps is exactly what arises in the dynamical mordell lang and this fourth equivalence which is slightly shakier <laughs> is exactly what arises in the dynamical andre ord okay so those might come up in future talks and so just some some small bits of notation for you there OK, so given that we have this rephrasing of torsion as preperiodic, and preperiodic, by the way, it's perfectly nice for any dimension subvariety, right? It doesn't matter. We can actually replace this classical Manning Mumford conjecture with a dynamical version. OK, and this was done exactly by Shou Zhang, who had made significant work on, on sort of a, a different approach than Reynolds to the Manning Mumford conjecture, which led him to conjecture the following translated version. OK. That if we take an, an endomorphism, let's, oops, sorry. There we go. That if we take an endomorphism of a complex projective variety, subject to a condition which I'll discuss in just a second, and we take a subvariety of that, say variety X, then that subvariety, oh, I see a typo, sorry, contains as a risky dense subset. subset of preperiodic points of the map if and only if the subvariety itself is preperiodic for the map. Okay? So, in other words, a subvariety is dynamically special if and only if it contains Zariski dense dynamically special points. Okay? All right. So, what is this condition polarized, by the way? Well, here's the definition of polarized it's a condition on the existence of a certain type of ample line bundle, or rather, <laughs> the existence of an ample line bundle on which f acts as by pullback as multiplication by an integer, or rather, power by an integer. Okay, but um, it, it's slightly easier in in reality, <laughs> or at least for some, to think of it in terms of this equivalent notion, which is that the map from x to x is polarized exactly if there exists some embedding of x into projective space which extends the dynamics right so i can just think of instead x as some invariant variety under a projective space map okay 
This condition of polarization is definitely at least surface level necessary. Okay, and the reason why is, is sort of silly, right? And so if I can zoom a little bit on the necessity here. So here's a, a counter example to removing the condition of polarization and hoping to have a dynamical money in Mumford. So if we take say f of x, y to be the map which squares the first coordinate and cubes the second coordinate on the affine plane, then one can simply compute the iterates of f, right? These are just powering maps. The nth iterative f will have the action of x to the 2 to the n on the first coordinate and y to the 3 to the n on the second coordinate. Okay. And so in particular, the pre-periodic points of this map are precisely the points where both coordinates are rates of unity. Okay. And I guess, sorry, zero or infinity as well, I should have added. But. Um, and so in particular, the diagonal certainly contains infinitely many pre-periodic points. But the diagonal is itself obviously not pre-periodic for this map. Okay, so some condition on degree in this sort of split case or polarization more generally is necessary to obstruct these sort of like silly exceptions. Okay, all right, so the first comment I should make is that this does in fact generalize the classical manning mumford conjecture. Okay, in other words, I can take, for example, an abelian variety and I can associate to it a multiplication by m map where m is any integer greater than two, or at least two rather. Then in fact, it's not hard to show that this is actually polarized, okay? It's polarized of degree m squared, essentially just by the theorem of the cube. You can do the computation here, all right? And so this map is polarized and by the classical dynamical or <laughs> classical money Mumford rather, a subvariety is preperiodic if and only if it is a torsion translate of an abelian subvariety. Okay. And so the torsion points are precisely then the preperiodic points in this case. And we recover from the dynamical money and Mumford conjecture, the classical money and Mumford conjecture. So that's the good news. The bad news is that it's false, <laughs> as stated. Um, so a counterexample sort of initially due to Gyoka and Tucker, and then it appears in a, in a paper of theirs joint with Zhang, um, and then generalized to higher dimensions by Fabian Pazuki, provides counterexamples, oddly sort of, if you're a dynamicist, provides counterexamples precisely in the setting of abelian varieties, okay? Which is the, and the issue here, the reason why the dynamical version fails while the classical version holds, is that for other endomorphisms, so not multiplication by an integer, it's not true that you're preperiodic if and only if you're a torsion translate of an abelian subvariety. Okay, so here is a very concrete example. So let me take a, an elliptic curve with complex multiplication. Okay, and let me take two elements of its endomorphism ring, which, okay, once I identify with some order, two elements which have the same size. Okay, then it's not so hard to show that the diagonal in E cross E is preperiodic for the split map, which multiplies by alpha in the first coordinate and beta in the second coordinate, if and only if the quotient here is a root of unity. Okay, and of course we can certainly construct alpha and beta, which have this property, but whose, whose um, ratio is not a root of unity. Um, so for example, here, if we take E with the square lattice, then say five and three plus four I would be such a pair. Okay. So there's plenty of counterexamples constructed in exactly this way because delta E need not be preperiodic, okay? But it will always be the case that it contains as a risky dense subset of preperiodic points because the preperiodic points are endomorphisms, they're simply the torsion points. Okay. All right. So to resolve this issue, Gyoka, Tucker, and Zhang propose the following modification of the dynamical money and Mumford conjecture. Uh, the, using the equality here is to get the polarization to answer Alison Miller's question, <laughs> okay? In order to have a polarized endomorphism, we want them to have the same degree, essentially. Yeah. Okay, maybe I should pause and see if there are other questions about that before I continue. No? Okay. <laughs> 
It's going really well, Holly. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> All right. So Gyoko Tucker and Junk proposed a modification of this conjecture. And I'm not really going to get into it because it's slightly long and there's perhaps a little bit of internal debate, at least in my own head, about how much I like this statement. Um, but the idea is that what went wrong in the previous slide, in the previous counterexample, is, is an issue that can really only arise for maps that come from algebraic groups. Okay? The issue is that it's quite subtle to say what it means for a map of projective space to come from an algebraic group. Okay, we'll see some examples of why I, why I say that later. Okay, and so the idea of their condition is essentially forbidding this sort of bad behavior of the counterexample when we actually do have a map coming from an algebraic group or coming from a group. Okay, and in addition to proposing this conjecture, they proved a couple of cases. Uh, first of all, happily, sort of <laughs> for the case of abelian varieties, and second of all, for the case of uh, lines in in P1 cross P1 under the action of a split endomorphism. Okay, but rather than digging too deep into, into this modified conjecture, let me rather just say, <laughs> let's ask the dynamical money and Mumford question, okay, for which pairs of projective variety and self-map of that projective variety, in particular polarized endomorphism, I'll assume, does the dynamical money and Mumford conjecture actually hold? Okay, all right, so this is known in a number of cases, but it is certainly open in a broader sense, right? So, so in some, some sense, a lot of the cases basically come down to the low dimensional setting that are known. And there's not a whole lot known in full generality. One of the cases which is best understood is the case when X is a product of copies of the Riemann sphere and the map is acting coordinate wise, so so-called split endomorphisms of P1 to the M. Okay, and these will be polarized if I take these endomorphisms, so just some rational map here, i.e. quotient of polynomials, will send the Riemann sphere to itself, i.e. P1 to itself. As long as they have the same degree, then I can obtain a polarization. Okay, that's not, not a problem. And when I do this, it's actually because of the nature of the split endomorphisms, a lot of the study of this question reduces to the study of, of dynamics on P1, okay? And so there's a decent amount of progress made. Um, here are some of the, the related um, contributors. And I wanted to highlight in particular the work of Gyoko, Nian, and Yi, because they essentially settle this question for split endomorphisms, okay, of P1. Okay. All right, some other cases that have some progress, and I'll just briefly highlight these. Um, so one of the few cases which does not essentially reduce to the one-dimensional case is uh, work of Dujardin and Favre, um, polynomial automorphisms of A2. Um, there's some nice work of Linz on monomial maps of toric varieties. And in addition, some work, actually some, some reasonable progress in particular by, by Juny on maps which are lifts of the Frobenius. Okay. I don't wanna get into detail on all of these, but I'm happy to provide the papers for you if you're interested. I should say, by the way, I, I added the link to Umberto's book, but I will also make sure that somewhere available is a full list of, of the links that I suggest here, but don't actually have links to. <laughs> okay, so the analog, let me go back a little bit here. The analog of torsion to pre-periodic that I gave you, that in a group, torsion points are pre-periodic, is rather naive, <laughs> right? There is in fact a much deeper connection between these two fields given by the study of height functions. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, too far, there we go. So in the case when your variety and your endomorphism are in fact defined over a number field, okay? We can define a height function which is in analogy with the canonical height on an elliptic curve. Okay, so exactly using the same construction as Neron and Tate did on for heights on an elliptic curve, Colin Silverman produced for any polarized endomorphism of a projective variety a canonical height associated to that endomorphism. Okay, so here's its definition it's simply a limit of 
classical height here. So I'm assuming that I have some height function defined on my variety. And I evaluate that height function at iterates of a point and scale it appropriately. This limit will exist and it will provide for me a well-defined function to the non-negative reals on the algebraic over k points of my variety. Okay. This height then has the following properties. Okay, well, immediate from definition, we see how it transforms when we apply the map. So if we look at the height of the iterate of a point under F, then this in fact is exactly the height of the point multiplied by the degree of the map, okay, which we see in this polarization, D. The second property is that it is a height function in the sense that it is a bounded distance away from sort of the naive height or the, the Ve height that we have on X, okay? I'm thinking of this height coming from the embedding related to L, by the way, um, for, for those of you who would like me to be careful, sorry. <laughs> okay, and finally, this height, or perhaps most importantly, this height has a local decomposition, just like the narrow and Tate height does, okay? And so I won't get into exactly how you define this local height function, because it's slightly complicated, um, in the case, in the general case, but there's a nice local decomposition here. We have local height functions and uh, this can be defined, though it depends on the polarization, this can be defined at um, any point away from the support of the divisor for the line bundle that we have for our polarization, okay? And I wrote here HF with a hat on it because um, at least one of the people speaking in this series always writes the canonical height to have a hat. Okay, all right. So that's the definition of this canonical height. But the key thing for our purposes in terms of trying to study preperiodic points is that this canonical height is zero if and only if a point is, the point you're evaluating is preperiodic for the map. Okay, so this height function picks out the, the preperiodic points for us. All right, so as a first example, we can recover, say for example, the naive height on P1, if we take the map to be Z maps to Z to the D, right? The powering map of degree D. Because by definition, the nth iterate of a point will simply be that point to the D to the N. And so by the properties of the naive height, this is exactly equal to the naive height of the point, okay? So the preperiodic points then are exactly the points which have naive height zero, i.e. the roots of unity, zero, and infinity. Okay, which is good because those are in fact the preperiodic points for this powering map. Okay, um, I see another question, but I can't tell if there's kind of been a conversation going on or if you would like me to answer that question. The one by Will, I don't know, Will, do you want to ask it yourself or? Yeah, I'm sorry, I just got confused about the previous um, example. And and the theorem, which is like, mm -hmm. you look at your bad example for E cross E, mm -hmm. and then you mod out both E's by plus or minus one. Do you mm -hmm. not get a bad example for P1 cross P1 that's split? Uh, yeah, so the thing that I didn't tell you is that you have to be careful. Uh, I don't remember if exactly that example will produce a problem. I would have to think for a second. But um, when I'm talking about this question here, uh, I, in fact, I didn't tell you or write it, I apologize, is that the, the split case in full generality needs either the stronger conjecture, so this conjecture of Yoka, Tucker, and Zhang, or the assumption that the maps you're dealing with are not exceptional, okay? And without defining what exceptional is, the map you just defined is exceptional. <laughs> Great, makes sense. All right. I'll talk a little more about exceptional maps later. Yeah, whereas Fabian says, no lattes. <laughs> Okay. All right. So first example recovers the Vey height. So the Vey height itself is a height function, a dynamical height function. We also recover narrow and Tate heights, okay, just by using the multiplication by M map. Here is exactly the example you're asking me about. <laughs> okay, so if we take an elliptic curve, I'll take the Legendre elliptic curve. So I take some parameter T, which is not zero or one. Uh, I should have said that T is algebraic, of course. And I look at the elliptic curve, y squared is x times x minus one times x minus t. 
then I can induce a map on the Riemann sphere simply by taking the quotient by the minus one involution, okay, which in this form is just the x coordinate projection, okay. Then this diagram commutes, and what I end up with downstairs is a self map of degree four of that Riemann sphere. All right, so this is known as a LATAS map, <laughs> as has been advertised in the, in the chat. And the height is exactly what you would suppose it is, which is the push forward of the narrow and tate height on the elliptic curve. Okay, so this dynamical height is just going to be evaluated by the narrow and tate height on the elliptic curve. But the interesting thing to note, and what will come up later, is that the preperiodic points of a map like this are therefore going to be Zariski dense. In, sorry, not Zariski, Euclidean dense in the Riemann sphere, right? Because we know that the torsion points are dense in the elliptic curve and our map doesn't change anything. Okay. All right, so I said these local heights are complicated, but for self maps of the, of the Riemann sphere, they're not that bad, okay? So in particular for polynomials, they're very well understood things, at least from the perspective of, of potential theory, uh, because they're Green's functions for, for dynamical objects associated to the endomorphism. So let me define for you these dynamical objects. So now let's restrict our attention here to, to P1, self maps of P1, okay? So I'm going to define, these are sort of the basic objects of dynamical study, at least in complex dynamics of the Riemann sphere. So the FA2 set of the map is the collection of points well, formally, it's the collection of points on which the iterates form a normal family, okay? But if it's been a while since that complex analysis, all I mean is that the orbits under iteration behave the same as they do at alpha on a neighborhood of alpha, okay? So we have stable behavior under iteration in the long term. That's the Fatu set. The Julia set is the complement of the Fatu set, so the unstable points where no prediction is possible in the long term. There's no neighborhood on which the iterates form a normal family. And in the case when f is a polynomial, there's a slightly easier characterization of this Julia set. So when we take a polynomial, of course, if we take points which are close to infinity and start iterating them, they're going to get closer and closer and closer to infinity if the point, say, is very large compared to the coefficients of the polynomial, right? Then the map is basically just acting like z to the d, where d is the degree of the polynomial, okay? And so we can define the filled Julia set to be the set of points which do not iterate to infinity if f is a polynomial. And in that case, this filled Julia set characterizes the Julia set, the, the unstable points, precisely as its boundary. Okay, so the Julia set is the topological boundary of the filled Julia set when we're dealing with polynomials. And of course, these things have been very well studied by complex dynamicists for a very long time. So here are four Julia and filled Julia sets. So what you should know is that each of these four pictures is a picture of the complex plane, centered at zero, it looks like. The filled Julia sets are the, the points colored black, okay? If something escapes to infinity, it's colored blue, and the color of blue, in fact, the shade depends on how quickly the escape happens, okay? So here is the map, the polynomial map z squared plus one. We see it's filled Julia set, and it's Julia set is this sort of fractally bit around the edge, <laughs> okay? And here is one, I didn't write the polynomials. It's also z squared plus c, but c was just sort of like a complicated complex number. So I didn't bother writing it, but it's another quadratic polynomial. Again, we have some interior filled Julia set here and the Julia set is a complicated fractal on the boundary. z squared plus i will come back to a couple of times. So I included it here. In this case, the filled Julia set is the same as the Julia set, there's no interior. And so this is the this sort of lightning shape is the unstable locus. And we can also get disconnected things like this Cantor set when we take a map like z squared plus one half, okay? Where you can't see any of the black points, but it's sort of the accumulation of, of the blue shades. Okay, so there's these basic dynamical objects. And just to get our hands dirty, we can actually compute this for certain special maps. So for example, if I take a power map like z squared, then I can simply analyze what happens to a point under iteration because I know exactly what the nth iterate of the point is, right? And so if the point starts in the unit disk, then in the long term, it iterates to zero. If it starts outside the unit disk, then in the long term, it iterates to infinity. And so those are both stable areas, right? The, the long-term behavior under iteration doesn't change if we perturb a little bit, 
But once we're on the unit circle, we have unstable behavior because if we perturb in the unit circle, we get different behavior than if we perturb out, okay? And so the Julia set in this case is the unit circle, which is why I didn't include the picture in the last slide because it's not very attractive. <laughs> okay. All right. So even though this is a simple example, and in general, you can almost never compute a Julia set in this way, there are a couple of very important general phenomenon illustrated by this example. So one is that, remember the, the pre-periodic points for this map are precisely the roots of unity, zero and infinity, okay? And so in particular, all but finitely many of those points are contained in the Julia set, in this unstable set, okay? That's generally true for rational maps, okay? Secondly, there is an invariant probability measure supported on the Julia set, okay? An invariant meaning that the pullback multiplies the measure by D and the push forward leaves the measure fixed, okay? What is that measure in this case? It's Lebesgue measure on the unit circle, right? Certainly has this property. That measure exists more generally and is known as an equilibrium measure for the map or rather the equilibrium measure for the map, okay? All right. So here's the thing. This measure, to some extent, sees certain points of the map, okay? So we can see, for example, sorry, let me go back for a second. If I look at this, this sort of toy example, rather, toy example of the squaring map, the roots of unity, the pre-periodic points for this map, that invariant measure, the Lebesgue measure, they're in fact sort of evenly distributed <laughs> with respect to the Lebesgue measure in a way that I'll make precise, okay? And that's the thing that I'm about to generalize. So the first result is that in general, if I take one of these degree D self maps of the Riemann sphere, then in general, there exists some unique F invariant probability measure supported on the Julia set, just like Lebesgue on the circle was supported on the Julia set of the squaring map, such that Okay, for almost every point on the Riemann sphere, if I take this discrete measure, which is evenly supported on pre-images of a, that fixed point on the Riemann sphere, so these are the collection of points which map after n iterates to alpha, and I'm taking the probability measure equally supported on them, then this measure converges in the weak star topology to this invariant equilibrium measure, okay? So here's an illustration of this happening for Z squared plus I, okay? So what I have on the left here is the Julia set of Z squared plus I. What I have on the right is the collection at the same scale, the collection of um, up to six pre-images of the fixed value alpha equals I under the dynamical map Z squared plus I. And here they're superimposed on each other. And even though, okay, you can't really see the measure in the picture, you see that the, the points themselves are sort of evenly distributing, <laughs> extremely bad drawing, evenly distributing throughout the Julia set for Z squared plus I. And if I were to take sort of larger and larger um, levels of pre-images, I would do better and better. Okay. Here's, here's another version of that exact same phenomenon, but this time I've taken a point which is not in the Julia set to start out with. In fact, it has nothing to do with the Julia set, which is alpha equals nine. Okay, and now the points which are pre-images don't live inside the Julia set, but they are still going to sort of glom in as I take larger and larger pre-images onto that Julia set. In fact, onto that equilibrium measure. Okay. All right. So it's not just pre-images that exhibit this phenomenon of realizing this equilibrium measure. It's also, just like in the roots of unity case, the pre-periodic points, okay? So I'll state this for periodic points for the moment, okay? So not only does that equilibrium measure mu f, not only is it realized as an equidistributed image of pre-images, but in fact, if I let say pure n of f denote the n periodic points for that map f, and I take again the discrete measure equally supported on elements of that set, then this thing converges in the weak star topology to that unique equilibrium measure. Okay, and the picture is a little harder to see here, but if in this picture I again have the, the, the map Z squared plus I, and I've tried to pick out the points of period one through five in this picture, okay? 
Remember, all but finitely many of the periodic points live in the Julia set. In this picture, all of them do. Okay, and you can see them living here and distributing more or less evenly on that Julia set. Okay. All right, so what is the unification? Okay, we have sets of pre-images and we have periodic points for the map. Both exhibit this equidistribution phenomenon. The point is that once we put the arithmetic into the picture, these points look exactly the same. <laughs> these sequences, these countable collections of points. And the reason why is that canonical height, okay? So if this entire picture is actually defined over a number field and I have a canonical height, then remember I have this relation, right? That what the canonical height does to iterates. And in particular, if I take a pre-image, say an nth pre-image of that point alpha, which I fixed ahead of time, then its canonical height will exactly be the canonical height of alpha divided by the degree of the map to the nth power. And so that's gonna to go to zero as n goes to infinity. And of course, remember that the pre-periodic points, and in particular, the periodic points were all points of canonical height zero, okay? And so the unifying picture in the arithmetic setting is that these are both collections of points of small height, okay? Height which goes to zero as the sequence of points goes to infinity, or as the index goes to infinity, rather. Okay. And so this unification, so as done in the abelian variety setting by Shapiro, Ulmo, and Zhang, this unification was accomplished in the arithmetic dynamical setting um, back between, I guess, 2004 and 2006. So probably there are people here who can correct me if I'm wrong. Please feel free to do so in the chat. <laughs> oh, thank you, Antoine, and some more attribution, which I will add um, to the slide later. Okay, and the statement is that, in fact, for this canonical height, we always have this phenomenon, that if we take a collection of points of small height, so I'm calling this here Xn, and sorry, I'm again noticing a quick um, typo, which is this is the canonical height associated to F. So we take some collection of points of small height, okay, meaning going to zero, then goes to infinity, and we look at their Galois orbits, and we look at the measure supported on those Galois orbits evenly, then these things are going to converge in the weak star topology to the equilibrium measure associated to the map. But the thing is, it's not just going to happen in the sort of Archimedean setting of the complex dynamics results we saw before. This actually happens for any choice of place of the number field. Okay, now I haven't told you yet <laughs> what a viatic equilibrium measure is. Okay, I've told you what it is in the Archimedean setting, but that's it. And I'm not going to tell you too much about it. <laughs> but this is the statement is that the unifying perspective when there is arithmetic is that it's points of small height which equidistribute to this natural measure. Okay, maybe I should pause in case there's questions. No? It's going well. Okay, great. All right. So just to comment on the, on the terminology in this theorem, so it's replicated up in the corner here, so you don't have to remember it. Um, so what are these, these viatic local heights? Well, I don't want to tell you what they are, <laughs> but what I do want to tell you is that giving the information of this viatic, sorry, not local heights rather, but local measures, giving the information of this viatic local measure is the same thing as giving the information of a local height function, okay? So we can go between the two, two flexibly. And then what is the space on which this convergence is happening, right? Where do these measures actually live? Well, in the Archimedean setting, they live on the Riemann sphere. That's no problem. In the non-Archimedean setting, we don't just want to let them live in some CP or something like that or CV, okay? Because there's not good topology for measure theory there. And so these are in fact going to live on the viatic Berkovich projective line, which in the non-Archimedean setting is this, this R tree, which perhaps looks slightly complicated, but is in fact much easier generally than the Archimedean setting. Okay, so without getting into the details, there's some analogous space here where I can define these equilibrium measures. So I have one for every place, okay? In other words, I have an adelic equilibrium measure. And just a comment here, even though I won't say anything about it, um, this equidistribution theorem has been generalized um, to polarized endomorphisms. Okay, all right.
So what's the takeaway here? So the takeaway of this equidistribution theorem is the following. So if I have some map defined over number field, some endomorphism defined over number field, its preperiodic points are points of height zero, okay? And so once I have a large set of them, say a Zariski dense set of them, okay, they cannot just sort of freely live around the variety because I know that they have to satisfy this equidistribution theorem, okay? And so what arithmetic equidistribution allows us to do is to translate questions on the geometry of preperiodic points to questions, on, questions about classif classifying this adelic measure associated to the map. Okay, so if there's only one thing you remember from this whole talk, please let it be that thing. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what does this have to do with dynamical money in Mumford? Well, as I just said, we should be able to read off something about the geometry of where these height zero points can live in the case when we have an arithmetic setup, when everything's defined over a number field, okay? And so this general plan of attack that was successful, for example, in the split case for dynamical money in Mumford um, is based on the ideas of Shapiro, Ulmo, and Zhang, but due in sort of the dynamical setting to Baker and DeMarco, okay? And the idea is this. I'm gonna do a very basic case I'm going to do the case when we look at P1 cross P1 as our ambient variety, equipped with an endomorphism, which is split, so F and G, F on the first coordinate, G on the second coordinate, where F and G are maps of the same degree of the Riemann sphere. I'm going to assume everything is defined over a number field, and I'm going to ask the Manning Mumford question, the dynamical Manning Mumford question, simply for the subvariety, which is the diagonal inside P1 cross P1. Then what is the plan of attack? The plan of attack is the following. So the first thing is we apply equidistribution, the theorem of the previous slide, right? So by arithmetic equidistribution, what does it mean for the diagonal to have infinitely many preperiodic points? We're trying to recover in this case then that the diagonal is preperiodic itself, right? What it means for the diagonal to have infinitely many preperiodic points for this split map is precisely that it contains infinitely many points, or rather that F and G, the maps, have infinitely many common preperiodic points, right? That's simply the translation in this split case. Now, what does it mean for two maps of the sphere to have infinitely many common preperiodic points? Well, by arithmetic equidistribution, that tells me that their measures have to be the same at every place. These adelic equilibrium measures have to agree. So they have the same adelic equilibrium measures, because those recover the canonical height functions, they have the same dynamical height functions. Because those height functions have the same set of zeros, <laughs> they have the same set of periodic points, preperiodic points rather. And because the support of those measures are the Julia sets, they have the same Julia sets. Okay, so all of this simply from having infinitely many common preperiodic points. All right, now the measure classification. What does it mean for them to have the same adelic measure, to have the same set of preperiodic points? Well, in this sort of simplified case, this is something that was already well known. So there's a theorem from uh, 1990 of, of Levin, which states that if we actually have, this is just in the Archimedean setting, that if we actually have the same equilibrium measure and the same set of preperiodic points, it's not stated in quite this way, but it's in Russian anyways, so probably most of you are not gonna read it, and the same set of preperiodic points, then either F and G are exceptional in the way that I halfway talked about before, or we have a, a sort of symmetry between F and G, okay? A dynamical relation between F and G, okay? And so applying this theorem, at least in the non-exceptional case, okay? What we see is that in order for the diagonal to have infinitely many preperiodic points under that split map, that means that the two maps have to have the same set of preperiodic points and the same equilibrium measures from which we deduce this relation of Levin and therefore we obtain a preperiodic diagonal as conjectured, okay? So this sort of simple outline improving this very like restricted case of dynamical money Mumford is really at the heart of, of basically all of the, the references and the proofs that have been, have been found so far. All right, so just a comment here, by the way, I mean, this classification theorem, it is not the case that if two Archimedean equilibrium measures are the same, then the maps are the same or somehow dy dy dynamically related, okay? Um, there's like, it, there's, this is secretly a global statement because I assumed that they have the same set of preperiodic points in addition to that, okay? 
All right. All right, so this is sort of the restricted example, but one can generalize this in a number of ways. Okay. All right. So let's just get our hands dirty a little bit more with this split example. So here's just to, to illustrate sort of how the Julia sets can be almost the same. The measures can be sort of similar at all places, but if they're not the same, then we can still cannot possibly have this, this um, failure of dynamical money Mumford. So in this example, I have F Z squared minus two and G Z squared minus six. And I'm looking at the induced split map on P1 cross P1. Okay, it happens to be the case here that the non-Archimedean measures all coincide, okay? In the Archimedean place, the Julia sets actually have infinite or overlap, okay? So I tried to draw this here. It's a little hard to see. Z squared minus two, the Julia set is just an interval from minus two to two. Z squared minus six, it's a Cantor set that is supported inside of these figure eights, okay? And so the overlap is in fact infinite. But nonetheless, because the measures are not the same, because the Julia sets are not the same, they can have only finitely many common preperiodic points. And in particular, then the diagonal is not preperiodic under this action of the split map. Okay, here's a slightly more interesting example. Okay, so let's take X, for example, to be a smooth genus two hyperelliptic curve. And let's assume it has the following affine model, okay? So what this affine model buys for me, okay? So this is a two-dimensional space inside the three-dimensional moduli of genus two curves, right? What this affine model buys for me is essentially the statement that C admits a double cover to some elliptic curve, okay? I've written down exactly what it is here, but we don't need to get into the details, okay? So C admits a double cover, not just to one, of course, but then to two elliptic curves. And we can exhibit them sort of in a very hands-on way if we're, if we're interested in doing so. And I'll write them as, as pi i once I put the elliptic curves in Legendre form, okay? So I have these two maps, one to say ET1 and one to ET2, where ETI is the Legendre elliptic curve. And this pi one and pi two are double covers of this, well, well, really this, smooth genus two hyperelliptic. Okay, if I do this, then I can, of course, descend to the Lattes map from each of the maps of the elliptic curves, right? And so if I do that, then I can, I can um, study the, the geometric torsion points of the curve embedded inside its Jacobian, so up here, by studying the preperiodic points for the induced map on P1 cross P1, okay? So those Lattes maps, so FT1 and FT2, their preperiodic points down here will be precisely the images of the torsion points upstairs. And under the construction that I gave you, this curve actually maps to the diagonal inside of P1 cross P1. Okay. And so by the split, okay, I realize these are exceptional maps, but nonetheless, we have different measures in this case for these two, different equilibrium measures for these two maps. And so the diagonal cannot be preperiodic for this split map and therefore has only finitely many preperiodic points for the split map on P1 cross P1. Since the vertical maps are finite, that means that X has only finitely many torsion points inside of its Jacobian, okay? So in this very specialized case, we recover Crenaud's theorem um, if we're looking at these split genus two curves, okay? So here's the question I want to sort of mostly end on which is now that we know we have some finite set, an obvious question is how large can this finite set be, right? So forget, say, just this case of, of split, or rather, I'm always gonna think about split, but forget the case when I'm just looking at Lattes. If I just take two maps, say, of the same degree, let's assume, and they don't have the same height function, then how large can the intersect intersection of their preperiodic sets be? So this was the picture at the beginning, right? So these are the, the preperiodic points for that FT1, FT2 coming from Lattes maps, or rather that are Lattes maps, coming from the parameters T1 is minus one and T2 is equal to four. This is a picture of the complex plane 
a point is is blue if it's close to a torsion image for the first or sorry the second rather curve and it's red if it's close to a torsion image for the first curve and of course as i noted before because these the torsion is dense upstairs these preperiodic points are dense in the euclidean topology on the riemann sphere downstairs but nonetheless they have finite overlap okay so this question of how large this set can be, naively asked is as large as we want, okay? So if we allow the degrees of the map to grow, then it's not hard to cook up an example that has as many common preperiodic points as you want. But what we suppose might be true, I think we called it a conjecture in our paper, though I probably should have looked before not calling it a question, um, is that in fact, if you fix the degree of the map, then this behavior cannot happen. That there is some uniform bound on the number of common preperiodic points for two maps which have distinct dynamical heights. Okay, and I'm realizing that I should have added that this is actually over a number field so that this part makes sense. Um, but let's just leave that there. Okay. All right. So why do we make this conjecture? Well, first of all, we have some evidence for it in very limited cases. So in the case when, say, both f and g are quadratic polynomials, we know that this conjecture holds, OK? Um, and I should say, since I want to remove that algebraic assumption, this holds whenever c1 is not equal to c2. They don't have to be algebraic, OK? And similarly, we know this conjecture holds whenever t1 is not equal to t2 for that legendre lattes map. But there's a uniform upper bound on the number of common preperiodic points. And so this sort of uniform question in the dynamical mining Mumford, because of course that could be translated to a question about the points on the diagonal for the associated split map of P1 cross P1, is a natural generalization of what happens back in the classical setting, right? Where one can certainly ask exactly the same question when we look at Reynolds theorem, which is once we know that a curve embedded in its Jacobian has a finite number of torsion points, how many are there as the curve varies in moduli? And one might suspect that really the only thing that matters is the genus of the curve, okay? And there's been a lot of progress on this question. Um, all of the, the references that I have here depend on, so what they obtain here is the bound that depends at, at the least on the field of definition of the curve, okay? In particular, it's extension degree over Q. Okay, um, I've highlighted this most recent work of Dimitrov, Gao, and Haubegger. They also have an alternative condition where the dependence is on the height of the Jacobian. Okay, but what we found by studying these split endomorphisms of P1 cross P1 is that actually this uniform classical Manning Mumford question has a positive answer on that two dimensional family of genus two curves. Right? Because we proved the uniform bound on the common preperiodic points for those associated maps, we actually obtain the classical money Mumford has a uniform bound as well for this entire two dimensional family of genus two curves. And so one might propose, and I do know to write this as a question because my co authors have forbidden me from writing it as a conjecture in our papers, <laughs> that maybe this is a more general phenomenon. What must the number of preperiodic points on a subvariety, or better stated, the degree of the Zariski closure of the preperiodic points on a subvariety, depend on? Does it only depend on the obvious things, namely the degree of the morphism, the degree of the subvariety, and the dimension of the ambient space? Okay. And so that uniform dynamical Manning Mumford conjecture, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go ahead and skip this slide and that slide. And that slide. <laughs> this uniform dynamical Manny Mumford question is where I'll sort of leave you, aside from the following comment, which is that arithmetic equidistribution and the, and the strategy I have outlined provides the framework for a lot of other questions and, and results in dynamics. And one of my favorite is, is the dynamical analog of the Andre Ord conjecture. So this equidistribution phenomenon also occurs in moduli of dynamical systems, not just for an individual dynamical system. And so here, mostly because I wanted to show off the pretty picture <laughs> and because I think maybe someone will say a couple of words about dynamical Andre or later in the series, um, is a picture of an equidistribution to a different type of dynamical object, namely the Mandelbrot set or its boundary more precisely. All right, and with that, I will thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Holly. Um, are there any questions? And while people try and unmute or type, I'm going to make the comment that I organized together with Patrick Ingram a seminar online in arithmetic dynamics. And if you would like to come to it, I will put the link to our website in the chat. <laughs> So do people have any idea what these bounds might be? Are they going to be small bounds or huge bounds? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? So to my knowledge in the, the Lattes setting, right, that genus two curves question, right? Um, so let me go back to the actual family here. Here, right? So in this family of genus two curves, I believe the record is a result of Stoll's. So Stoll has found a curve like this, which has 34 geometric torsion points in its Jacobian. Um, that's the largest that I know of. Our techniques say that in are... the uniform theorems. Oh, uh, um, Holly, Holly, we couldn't hear you for, for a second. You might need to repeat your last sentence. Oh, sorry. OK. Am I all right now? Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. So um, Stoll's result is that he has found a curve of genus 2 in this family, which actually has 34 points inside of its, its Jacobian, um, which are torsion. And I don't know of any better, better bound than that, um, higher bound than that. <laughs> uh, but our, our techniques here, they're not intrinsically ineffective. They could be made effective. Um, in the case of taking, instead of taking pairs of these Lattes maps, if you take pairs of quadratic polynomials, they're actually quite easy to make effective, and we did so. And the bound you get is roughly like 10 to the 100 or something like that. <laughs> So I expect it's very far from reality. Great, let's see, are there other questions here? Let me just add that the, the next talk is by um, Patrick Ingram and um, I think that's in two weeks. Let me just quickly check. That's on June 9th. So uh, let's everyone thank Holly again and then sign off. Okay, take care.